Hello, everybody. It's me, Martha. I'm here today with the wonderful Maggie, who is living in Hawaii now after moving from the mainland and who feels, what were you saying, Maggie? You feel frozen. And frozen. So what I want to know is you said, you said in your email, I want to feel a spark of the magic. Yeah. Me, that tells me that you've felt it before. Oh, my whole life. Definitely. So, ooh, so tell me... And you also have a diagnosis of MS, is this correct? Yes, yes, I do. That's, that's a classic shaman sickness. And then when you start talking about magic, um, that leads me to believe you've got this streak of, of wild in you that <laughs> I really identify with. So <laughs> tell me what magical sparks feel like when you get them. Oh, like the beginning of kindling, the little glow of embers. Mm. And it's that beautiful feeling like if you just want to stare at a fire and it ignites within you. And when you're looking at the beginning of a fire sparking, you feel that warmth and that connection. Mm -hmm. And it also feels like a mystery. And, but you're okay with being in the mystery. All right. So I want you to tell me three times in the past when you felt that. Just describe very briefly what was going on. Uh, one time was when I woke up in the middle of the night. I was seven years old and I wasn't supposed to go look at the Christmas tree. And I went and looked at the Christmas tree and it was the most divine, magical experience I ever had. The lights were on and I just felt still and glowy. Um, another time was when I saw the Grand Canyon for the first time and I didn't expect to feel small, but I loved feeling very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, a third time for this spark would be when I was in uh, Lourdes, France, and I just, everyone was singing Ave Maria over and over again, and walking in a circle, uh, doing the rosary uh, for St. Bernadette. I was raised Catholic. So um, those were the three times. Interesting. So even just with three cases, I can see a pattern, and it's about awe and beauty and sacredness. Yes. Um, you know, tell me where I'm wrong. Because um, two are explicitly around a sacred ceremony. Christmas is a sacred ceremony, and so is the, the thing in Lourdes. And the Grand Canyon, it, it's so awe-inspiring. Gave you a sense of the, the enormity and majesty of the world, right? And you were yeah. a little part of it. Okay, so you, you moved. Now, I do want to say to everybody watching out there, the year after you moved to a new place, you feel completely chaotic and generally uninspired. And I've told this to literally hundreds of clients. You will move to this amazing place that you've, the perfect house or whatever it is, and you will feel like you made the worst mistake of your life. The first six months are chaos internally. Like okay. you'll get up anxious and uninspired every morning for six months. That's good and to hear. Yeah, and then for the next six months, it'll slowly get better. And after a year, you'll start to, what you'll have is a new set of behaviors that you never dreamed of before. You'll, you'll go thinking this is what life's going to look like. It's total chaos for six months, mellows out for another six months. And then you're like, wow, I'm doing all this stuff. I have new friends. I'm doing new activities. And th I never expected this. So you're, you're in the chaos period so you should just relax into that because we are creatures of the known and when our environment changes we have dramatic almost trauma responses yeah yeah so you need to be very gentle and <laughs> give yourself a lot of space to be in the chaos and that's it's not just not knowing what to do with your day it's also the grieving emotions you prisoners when they get out of prison have to grieve the loss of their routine right yeah. I mean, it's it's so in us to need that routine and we grieve yeah. when we don't yeah. have it. so sadness will come up anger will come up um feelings of futility self-questioning all of these are typical is this what you're getting oh definitely and it makes sense i that i would sort of just be completely burnt out because I was in Philadelphia doing research for two years, which I'm not from. So I, I, I was in this sort of completely um, chaotic environment there. And then a couple months before we moved here, we were set to move here. My mother had a, a bilateral stroke and she's in Georgia. Wow. So 
and I moved here for my health. So it was very uh, difficult, you know, so it's almost like the world just gave me all of these. Yeah. Pummelings. In, in my coaching system, we would call it square one. You've been knocked, I say on to square one because yes. um, you're, you're becoming a new person, but it feels like you're beginning all over again. You're, you're, it's a birth that is followed by an infancy and childhood that are, are very unsettling. Yeah. In our culture, we think we should just go up in a straight line, but actually things go in cycles like the seasons, like winter, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter, spring, summer, fall. So you're moving forward, but you're going through the same cycle of feeling like a helpless child and figuring out how to move through this new environment. Okay. So that makes sense. what do you think a typical day should look like for you? Oh, <laughs> Oh, I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, which I'm sure mm -hmm. you're used to. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have a typical day, I, I get up and have tea, meditate, do yoga, have a, a wonderful smoothie, have a filling paleo breakfast, uh, then uh, write uh, something brilliant, <laughs> and go and, and teach. And I, I, I'm an educator and librarian, so do one of those, but then come up with something brilliant by the afternoon. <laughs> you know, I, I do that to myself. That Dude. is definitely something. <laughs> Dude, this is not <laughs> what you do in square one. So, you got to think of yourself as a new baby. I remember one time when I had my brand new, my first child, I had her in a front pack and her little head was there. And I went to the grocery store and got a bunch of things and I didn't have enough hands to carry everything. So I balanced a, a bag of pasta on her head and held it in place. <laughs> my chin. And then somebody gave me a dirty look and I said, it's time she had a job. <laughs> <laughs> and then they tried to arrest me. No, they didn't, but they won't. <laughs> so you're like a new baby and you're telling yourself, it's time I had a job. And you're asking <laughs> for this huge level of productivity and brilliance and discipline and yoga and me. <laughs> yeah. You've got to pull back your expectations because the most important thing that's going on for you is you are changing. You have to adapt everything in your psyche and your body to a completely new set of environmental triggers and routines. And it's, it takes time grieving something you've lost your whole past, even though it, you're in a better place now, you have to go through the grieving process and it's physically exhausting. It takes time time and instead of producing i mean it's like you always want it to be high summer with the harvest on right yeah all the fruit you know just going out and picking fruit every day in reality we have to go fallow sometimes the ground has to rest if it's going to pr produce a new crop yeah it's a really scary thing for us because our culture so demands continuous productivity but it's it's not realistic i've never been able to do it and I always think I'm not doing enough. And I look back and people say, oh, you did a lot. And I'm like, most of the time I was just trying to cope. Yeah. So what's a real day like for you now? So you just gave us what you think you should do. What is actually happening on a typical day for you? Oh, I'm getting up and I'll have, I'll have tea and I'll have breakfast and I will go to, if I'm lucky enough, I'll have a substitute position here at the school my husband's working at um, and I'll go substitute and I will come home exhausted, really physically drained. And then I will cook dinner with my husband and uh, we'll sit in front of the fire. And it is lovely here. You know, we have huge windows and a small cottage and we'll go on a walk if it's not raining. If it's raining, we'll look at the rain and we might watch something on Netflix and go to sleep. It's very simple. <laughs> Actually, that's a lot. That is a lot. How much time do you spend just sitting and staring blankly? Oh, probably not enough. I'll tell you that when I was in Philly, I was in academia, so you can understand the pressure that I just got out of academia. There. <laughs> yeah, you've been there. So, okay, what, what I think this will sound radical. I'd ask you to experiment with it. Okay. I think that the perfect day for you right now would be to get up, go to the window, a big picture window or whatever, sit down with your cup of tea, 
and allow yourself to feel what you're feeling for at least half an hour, 45 minutes. Just let yourself feel what you're feeling without any resistance. Okay. You can't accelerate the process of transformation. You can only slow it down. You slow it down by trying to be the thing you used to be, right? Yeah. And you have this medical diagnosis. You have all these reasons, all these things coming to your attention that say, you need to be something a little different. Maybe a lot. <laughs> and Maggie, that's why the spark has gone out of your life. Because yeah. you were following the trail of the magic, and then you got in your head a certain kind of productive day. And the magic's not agreeing with you. No. So it's withholding that feeling of sparkle because it doesn't want to reinforce the wrong behavior. It doesn't want to lead you down the wrong path. Yeah? yeah. And the way you let the change happen at its optimal pace is you let go. You surrender. Almost all your time in this winter of your life is spent in surrender to feeling tired, to feeling alienated, to feeling like you're not getting enough done and kindness to yourself. Just permission and kindness. And then a little bit of productivity, maybe an hour a day. You know, so when you substitute, you have to do more than that, but it's exhausting you. Yeah. So to dare to let go in the fallow time is so hard for us. We want to force it to be summer when it's winter. But winter is the time when everything restores itself. Yeah. The magic may come in the quietest, smallest moments. So what you do in that time is you, choose, you look for awe and sacredness. Because that's where the magic's always been. And your mind is like a machine. Got to work, got to work, got to work. Instead, spend time feeling what you're feeling. And then looking for anything that inspires that awe and reverence. The ocean, bird outside. And that's going to make things change faster. And more to the point, it's going to make you know that that, that ember feeling is going to come back and you'll know, yeah, this is it. This is what I'm meant to be doing. It's so scary to think of sitting still and letting that happen. <laughs> I know. Isn't that weird? When Oprah did a broadcast with Eckhart Tolle where they were just silent for 30 seconds, 30 seconds, I saw these tabloids that said, Oprah is with a crazy man and they're doing witchcraft. <laughs> to be silent for 30 seconds in our culture is considered dangerous. Yeah. The most physically wealthy humans in the history of the world think it's dangerous to be still for 30 seconds. Yeah. What would nature be if we never let her have winter? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens if you let winter happen is that all the nourishment and all the magic comes back and it builds into a summer. But you get to enjoy all the seasons. You said mm -hmm. it's so scary. That's a fear you're just going to have to confront and question over and over. Is this the right thing to do? A diagnosis like MS can really help because it's scarier than the fear of breaking the rules. No? Yeah, it is. And my hope is as you dare to break the rules, you won't need the MS to scare you. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it always works for me. Yeah. So could you do, just add into your day an hour of staring blankly? <laughs> yeah, I could. I could. And looking for the awe. Yeah. Just looking at the ocean for half an hour and letting awe wash through you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, I think for me it's just a feeling, the block is feeling worthy of, of being there. You okay. know, pretend you're worthy and you just get to stare at the ocean <laughs> for half an hour. Imagine just staring and having everything taken care of, nothing else to do, just you watching the ocean. Imagine it. Okay. No stress, no fear. Now look inside you for the feeling of the embers. Can you find them? 
He said, you just need a spark. May not happen yet. I think that that's completely right. I, I know pretending that all of the cares and the worries are taken care of and that I can sit when I'm looking at the ocean. The free mind. <laughs> yeah. That goes immediately to the spark. Yeah. The free mind goes to the spark. Yeah. And you're blocking it with cultural fears about how productive you should be. So it's your yeah. job to question those fears, to start looking at the power of stillness, the power of lying fallow, and permission, permission, permission. And then paradoxically, things start to move and the summer yeah. comes again. Yeah. So stillness practice, would you do it for me every day? I will. And start with half an hour, try to build it up to an hour. You're in a new place, you've got MS, you've got a really exaggerated view of what you should do. You need an hour of stillness a day. This is my official <laughs> diagnosis. <laughs> Since I have no credentials for this one. <laughs> yes, I can. Willing? Oh, and then yeah. I'll see if the sparkle comes back and email me. I will. I will definitely. Cool. Well, it's been super wonderful talking to you. You're yes. so lovely. Best of luck in your new life. Um, best of luck with your shaman sickness. Uh, thank you. And just mark my words. The magic that comes if you do this is something you've never expected, and it's better than anything you imagined. <laughs>